to thank uh, Nick Martin from the Center of uh, German Studies and uh, Ian Governor for the Voices of Peace and War um, Center here in Birmingham for inviting us. Uh, we are very delighted to be here and we are very much looking forward to presenting to you the results of our project, project that actually really nicely links up to what we just have heard from, from Peter and uh, Katriona. But before, before we will start with the presentation of our project findings, I would like to take the chance to contextualize our project a little bit and to give you a few background information because these background information have to do actually with our, with our institute where we are, we are working because in a more or less symbolic way, we could say that that institute bridges the time of World War I and the interwar period with the way in which the war in this time is perceived nowadays. And, and why is that so? Uh, some of you might be uh, familiar with the fact that after the end of the Great War, uh, pacifist teachers of all kinds raised their voice saying we have to prevent a war like that in the future and the only way to do it is to change education and the way to change education and to promote peace and understanding in a classroom is to change the textbooks right and uh, so a variety of teachers activities uh, were established in the 1920s and the League of Nations took up that idea of textbook revision, of changing topics. The League of Nations created uh, subcommittees in the 1920 and in mid of the 1920s and to make a long story very short, in 1937 17, 17 countries signed an international treatment on textbook revisions. After 19 as we know, it didn't help too much because World War II broke out uh, only two years later. But after 1945, UNESCO, a successor organization of the Committee of um, Intellectual Cooperation within the League of Nations, took up the idea of textbook revision. And if you read the preamble the f of, the, of the covenant of the UNESCO, it would ac actually exactly say uh, to promote peace and education, we have to uh, to promote uh, 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 peace and, and, and uh, international understanding, we have to change education. And it was Georg Eckert, the founder of the Georg Eckert Institute, who took up these initiatives of the 1920s and established in the 50s and 60s a variety of bilateral textbook commissions under the umbrella of UNESCO, partly at least. There, there were more than 100 activities in these two decades in Europe between two or more uh, countries. There, for instance, also was a, a German, um, a British textbook commission in the 1950s to change the top topics, uh, to, uh, to change the, the textbooks in the way uh, to get rid of stereotypes of nationalistic and chauvinistic uh, contents. Our institute itself took up uh, those kind of uh, consulting work in the international uh, sphere and uh, most recently we have worked uh, with UNESCO and other international organizations in the Near Middle East, uh, in Southeastern Europe, uh, in East Asia to promote the change of curricula and textbooks to promote peace and to uh, resolve or to help to uh, resolve uh, conflicts. But that's only one pillar of our uh, work at the Institute to do this international textbook work. Another main pillar is research. We are an independent research uh, institute and what we do is we do research about the contents of textbooks, in particular history, geography and social studies textbooks. It's about the contents but uh, most recently we have started to do, to do also research about the production of textbooks on the one hand, but also on the way in which textbooks are used uh, and appropriate in classrooms through uh, uh, interviews, uh, uh, classroom observations and, uh, and things like that. And when we choose our topics, of course, we look at historical events that play a major role in public debate. And the centenary of World War I, of course, was such an event. And we developed in 2013 a project together with the city of Braunschweig and also with a high school in Braunschweig, a project which was called 1913 to 2013, uh, where we tried to, where we tried uh, um, to analyze textbooks from 18 from 18 countries, uh, we translated them and we developed uh, teaching modules uh, and we applied them with, uh, with the students together uh, uh, to teacher training seminars and we were actually looking at the way in which such an analysis could contribute to improve the instruction of World War I. One more sentence about this. Um, 
we all are more or less are aware that, of course, the memory of World War I in Europe is not a shared memory. It's not a common memory. Countries memor rise and commemorate the end of the Great War in many different ways. We have countries where the end of the war is celebrated as a national holiday. We have other countries as Germany where there is no Memorial Day at all about World War I. We know that in Western Europe the Great War is considered as the primary catastrophe of the 20th century, which is completely different in Eastern and Southeastern Europe, where the end of the war is seen as the beginning of the liberation from these, uh, from, from imperial regimes, uh, the beginning of uh, new national uh, states. And if we look beyond, if we look beyond Europe uh, to former colonies, of course, there the Great War is also seen in a different way, uh, uh, partly uh, as a proof of the uh, uh, of the way in uh, or, or the proof of the end of the civilizing civilization mission uh, of of Europe and basically Europe as as uh, in this being seen in a state of barbarism. Uh, well. Taking that into account, of course, the question for us was how is that then depicted in textbooks? Do we see these different ways in which nation, nation states commemorate uh, 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 World War I? Is that been depicted in textbooks too? And for us, it was very interesting to see, to compare, to look at those 18 countries and to compare it and then to ask the question if there is, a, if there is more than one way, more than one national interpretation of World War I, what kind of effect might that have on teaching uh, history and teaching World War I in, in, in the classroom. And I'm finishing with that. Uh, that was supposed to give you a certain, uh, a certain uh, uh, background of our project. And I would like to ask uh, my colleagues, Kerstin and, and Barbara, to go into detail about our findings. So Textbooks reflect how historic events are remembered within a nation across decades. They provide insights as to how the images that we create of the past change, for example on account of processes of societal rupture. While in our experience textbooks provide a reliable barometer reading of the, cultural, of the memory cultures of modern societies, they are nevertheless only rarely used within memory research. For this reason, we made it our mission to, firstly, emphasize the significance of textbooks as a valuable resource to researchers and, secondly, to show teachers wishing to incorporate issues of memory culture in the teaching what a powerful medium they already possess in the form of their textbooks. As you have already heard, in 2013, my colleague Barbara and I were given the unique opportunity to obtain reliable translations of chapters relating to World War I from many different countries from 1915 up until today. After looking through the vast material, we focused especially on the assassination of Sarajevo on the 28th of June 1914. First, this event is always mentioned in all the text we analyzed. Second, due to the widespread information available, there seems to be particularly little room for interpretation when it comes to this subject. While first familiarizing ourselves with the material, we concentrated on what was being recounted and what was being omitted. We were interested in the decision processes by which selections were made and which might have formed the basis for each narrative. We used diachronic comparison as a heuristic process. Knowledge of which events and information are presented in old textbooks renders it easier to detect what the new textbooks have abridged, omitted or perhaps even embellished. We can thus identify the framework that lands from a specific narrative. We then repeated the procedure of the framework analysis in a synchronic comparison. Diachronic and synchronic, national or transnational comparisons demonstrate that textbooks not only differ in terms of what they relate, rather they portray the same result with highly diverse linguistic tools. Differences thus exist with regard to both explicit and implicit messages. I would now like to show you three short examples selected uh, from rather more contemporary textbooks from three European nations, Germany, France and Great Britain. In a German textbook of 2009 we read the following. 
Alle wichtigen Staaten Europas waren zum Krieg bereit. Es fehlte nur noch ein Anlass. Man fand ihn in der Ermordung des österreichischen Thronfolgers Franz Ferdinand und seiner Frau Sophie durch serbische Nationalisten in Sarajevo. And I add the English translation because maybe you can't see it. All important European states were ready for war. All that was missing was a reason. The reason was found in the assassination of the heir to the Austrian throne, Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie by Serbian nationalists in Sarajevo. The first thing that particularly strikes us about these lines, which at first glance are rather sober in tone, is that they assign blame without question to Serbian nationalists, thus equating the latter with violent assassins. The stereotyping of the Serbs marks them as a war opponent of the German Reich of 1914. We are told nothing of possible motives, motives that the assassins might have had, nor do we learn of the oppressive Austrian rule in occupied Bosnia since 1908, how difficult it was for young people to receive a good education in a country which, which provided five secondary schools for some two million people. And I, could add, and I could add a few things more, but I won't because of the time. But back to the text excerpt. If I may now draw your attention to the third sentence of the German text, in which we read that Mann, in German, this is the equivalent of the now somewhat antiquated English one, third person singular, that someone found the reason for war that apparently everybody was looking for in the assassination of the Austrian heir to the throne. There is no specific subject of the sentence, and indeed in English is usually translated using the passive as we have done here. The text does not state that it was the Austrian government, supported by its German allies, who reacted to the attack with an ultimatum and finally with a declaration of war. Far from it. If we examine the sentence order more closely, the text rather suggests that all important European states shared the blame for the escalation of events. There is a strong imbalance in the responsibility management visible here, while we can see an extension and exaggeration of responsibility attributed to Serbia, the war opponent of the time, precisely the opposite is to be observed with regard to the ally Austria. Here the attribution of blame is kept to a minimum and the use of the indeterminate pronoun man avoids naming any specific responsible party. We find a dramatic, a dramatic contrast to the narrative of the German textbook in a front French example. I will present the text here in the English translation. As you will see, the text constitutes a clear contrast to the German view we have just seen. On June 28, the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, Franz Ferdinand, is murdered by a Bosnian student allied with Serbian nationalists. The assassination seems to give the Austrian government cause to annihilate Serbia and it confronted the latter in the Balkans. If we firstly turn our attention to the way in which the text refers to the protagonists, or in this case protagonist, this time we find no indeterminate pronouns. The text speaks of the action of one individual. It was one Bosnian student who murdered the heir to the throne. Serbia Serbs are only indirectly revolved here in the form of Serbian nationalists with whom the assassin was in league. The text does not state, however, that he was acting on their behalf. The former alias thus kept out of the firing line and protected from the accusation. The rhetoric used to speak in the former war opponent austro hungary shows far less restraint. The latter is alleged here in a clearly overdramatic manner to have intended to annihilate Serbia. While the accusation is qualified and put into proportion to a certain extent by the use of the word seems, which indeed always signals a certain distancing to a statement, nevertheless, there is hardly a more drastic accusation than that one of the will to annihilate a nation. Let us now summarize our findings thus far. Despite the Franco-German friendship that has been the driving force behind the EU and the Franco-German Textbook Commission, which has set an example for processes of reconciliation between former war opponents, it must be said that apparently unspectacular statements in fact harbor dramatically opposing views of the First World War. 
The position adopted by a British textbook is different yet again. It was June, 28th June 1914, far away from Britain. The Archduke Franz Ferdinand was shot in Sarajevo by a Serbian. The Archduke was heir to the Austrian throne. Austria was furious. Austria blamed Serbia for the Archduke's death. What followed was like whirlpool. The great countries of Europe jumped into this whirlpool. It was a whirlpool to war. As we can see here, the British textbooks, textbook adopt a somewhat sophisticated position than its German counterpart when it comes to the question of responsibility. The blame here is attributed to one Serb rather than the entire Serbian people. Unlike the French textbook, here the rather negatively associated work nationalism is not used. What is particularly interesting about this excerpt is doubtless something else. The laconic tone that expresses the peculiar nature of the First World War, a world war that was rooted far away on the continent, a war that, we may read between the lines, Great Britain would have done better to have kept out of. This reasoning is supported by the only rough sketch characterizing Austria-Hungary. We read that Austria was furious. The idea that is, bringing, that is being introduced here uh, implicitly is a differentiation between us, the rational and self-controlled island dwellers, and them, the almost animalistic peoples over there on the European mainland that are weak world victims of their own blind emotions. The following text, however, repeats three times the word whirlpool, which is incorporated into the narrative as an effective image. The war was suddenly upon us, like a natural phenomenon over which we have no influence, and the great powers were negligent in their actions. They jump, more or less without further consideration, into the whirlpool and forget, we are to assume, that dangers might await them, that they might be sucked in and find themselves out of their depth. Ultimately, uh, the whirlpool becomes an elementary force that makes with it everything in its wake to war. In a nutshell, the presentated almost contemporary narratives demonstrate how different national memories are still reflected in textbooks, despite all efforts towards Europeanization. Following this and taking Russia as an example, my colleague Barbara will now render visible different layers of interpretation in one and the same textbook. Maybe to, to shortly add some words on, on what my colleague Kerstin um, just told you. Um, we used those textbook quotes in training sessions for teachers of secondary schools and uh, we also used their way of, of reading those quotes, of reading different sense into those quotes in terms of inter interpreting them. So what, what Kerstin just presented is, is not only our subjective point of view, we kind of corroborated that uh, by discussing those quotes with different teachers. Yeah, as Kerstin already said, um, we've been reading textbooks in a way as, as memory text, reflecting the thousand different ways in which societies negotiate the meaning uh, of significant historical events like World War II. Uh, we, we have done this um, by referring to different methodological and theoretical approaches and in today's <coughs> presentation I would like to demonstrate you how we used actually the memory theories of Paul Ricoeur. Um, let me quickly remind you Ricoeur argues that each act of remembering is always polyphonic um, that is with multiple voices. Although memory bears the signature of specific of the specific present in which it emerges, it is simultaneously shaped by layers of interp interpretation coined in earlier times. To describe this phenomenon, Ricoeur uses the metaphor of a palimpsest. Um, he thus compares narratives of remembering to those manuscripts in the Middle Ages from which the text was scraped o scrapped off so that the page could be reused. Taking the example of Russia and following in the tracks of Ricoeur, I will read a textbook story on World War I as a palimpsest. Russia is, I think, a good case in a good point in case. Its culture of memory has experienced a couple of deep ruptures since 1914, with the emergence and collapse of the Soviet Union has not only changed its statehood three times, in addition, the ideological self-understanding of the Soviet Union has witnessed a number of sharp 
turnarounds, shifting from proletarian internationalism to various brands of nationalism, at times even heavily influenced by anti-Semitic undertones. All this has left, as I would like to show you now, traces in one Russian textbook printed in the year 2010, in which we find traces of narratives stemming from different times. The chapter starts with something like an orientation clause, characterizing the war as a conflict whose senselessness was already recognized by participants and eyewitnesses. The next sentence even more out, is even more outspoken when it states that the goals of none of the warring parties can be recognized as just and fair. The whole paragraph clearly reminds us of the tradition which dominated history writing right after the October Revolution. In line with the revolutionary spirit of these times and in an attempt to justify Russia's early withdrawal from the war, even at the expense of huge territorial losses, historians in the early days of the Soviet Union had described the war as, moral, as a morally corrupt adventure in which millions of people had died for the profit-seeking interests of a few capitalists. The Marx formula of imperialism as the highest stage of capitalism is expressed in another paragraph which comments on Italy's entry into the war. Full of moral disregard, the authors talk about the purest horse trading by which the diplomats of the Entente ensured in exchange for territorial gains promised to Rome the support of a country that as a matter of fact had been a close ally of Germany and Austria for many years. However, upon closer examination we will find a certain ambivalence in these sentences on the sudden change of alliances en enacted by the Italian government. On the one hand, some key words I've already quoted like the horse trading or costs payment invokes an anti-capitalistic framework. The trained Marxist will easily understand that capitalism is said to have caused the war. At the same time, these words also seem to express a kind of sadness or even disappointment. Wars are no longer what they used to be. One may want to read into these lines. Noble features like patriotism and bravery, one may add, have been replaced by sheer opportunistic considerations. In one word, the Russian nationalist of our day, who is driven by a deep mistrust in modernity and longs for the good old days, can subscribe to these words as well as the anti-capitalist follower of the October Revolution. A similar ambiguity is characteristic of another paragraph which deals with Russia's attitude towards the war. Again, the reader is faced with two rather opposing narratives. On the one hand, Russia is openly blamed for having pursued a very aggressive and expansionist agenda. According to the text, it not only strove to gain control over the Turkic Straits, it moreover dreamt of the restoration of a Greek empire with Constantinople as its capital. The authors clearly dismiss these policies as selfish and egoistic. They thus seem to adhere, adhere to a position expressed by the Russian historian Pakrovsky in the early 1920s. He declared the Tsarist Empire to be the chief culprit of the war and thus served the aim of providing legitimacy to the new Bolshevist government by discrediting its predecessor. On the other hand, the insight that Russia in being selfish was nothing but a normal state comes again with a dose of disappointment. A disappointment which seems to be informed by the expectation that Russia should be different, better. How this being better could look is spelled out at the beginning of the paragraph, when Russia is said to have at least initially supported Serbia in the spirit of orthodox brotherhood and beyond all cost-benefit considerations. Besides these rather ambivalent places, we also find clearly nationalistic statements in the Russian textbook. A good case in point would be the stories told about the General Brusilov, who in 1916, at the climax of the Battle of Verdun, started a massive attack which resulted in heavy losses at the Austrian-Hungarian front in Galicia. <laughs> In a tone that openly contradicts the heavy criticism directed against the leadership of Tsarist Russia just some pages before, he is said to give a shining example of strategic skills. It is obviously not by accident that the authors chose 
Brusilov for the role of the uncontested hero. He, the Tsarist officer who had uh, changed sides very quickly after the revolution and took part in the war the Soviets waged against Poland in 1920, received a state funeral in 1926 with all military honors and became the protagonist of many patriotic novels during the Second World War, only to be described as a pioneer of peace during the times of the Cold War. Passages which, looking at the year 1914, describe Germany as the warmonger number one, also argue very much in line with nationalistic sentiments. All previous talk about Russian guilt and the guilt of all imperialistic powers in general is thus declared null and void. Particularly the central powers, the text reads at one point, drove Europe and the whole world into the war. German politicians, the, next, the text continues, were not only thirsting for the overseas territories of Britain and France, they moreover ransacked the western territories of Russia. Obviously an experience with Germany in the context of the Second World War is projected here onto the times of the First World War, resulting in the evocation of eternal enmity between the two nations. With this I would like to conclude my contribution about the Russian textbook perhaps with um, the caveat not to prematurely fall into the trap of making orientalistic judgments about Russia and Russian history policies. Often we assume that such policy is entirely steered from above and that it is all tarred with the same brush, a brush that is said to be uh, crude and coarse at the same time. My reading of contemporary Russian history textbooks reveals something different, an astonishing wealth of unease and and openness to different interpretations. And here I would like to conclude.